The 1975 Olds Delta 88 Royale finally finished. Up next. Hi, this is Adam. Welcome to my Rare Classic Car channel. Today, the 75 Olds Delta 88 Royale Coupe finally finished after all of the work that you've been watching. So for those who haven't seen, this is a 4,000 mile car that I bought from the original owners in a farm town in northern Wisconsin. And I talked to the owner. Actually, it was the wife who really wanted to purchase this car new in 1975. She had been driving a 68 Oldsmobile 98 and loved it. But in 1974, someone rear-ended it while it was parked and totaled the car. So this was her replacement for her 98 and she drove it for a little while and related to me that she liked it so much she was afraid to drive it even in fair weather. So it got parked in the couple's barn. They owned a farm and it was a cement floor barn and just sat there really and sat and sat and sat and sat. They had plenty of other vehicles to drive. They actually own about 20 cars so this was not ever a daily driver and about six months ago this couple was entering their golden years and she was thinking gosh maybe I should pass this along to someone given that it's just sitting here and we don't understand how to restore it correctly or get it back on the road and that's how I bought it so some people ask you know how do I find these this was actually on Facebook marketplace and for what the car is, which is a beautiful cosmetic condition car, I got it for an extremely fair price. I'm guessing because anybody who came to see it and tried to drive it, this car did not run very well. It had the original tire still on it where on at least one tire, the tread had separated. So it shaked and shimmied as you drove it. And then the motor was sucking 40 you know, probably some 40 year old gas, but at least 15 or 20 year old gas. So I had to drain the tank, get all that out of there, rebuild the carburetor, put a new distributor cap and rotor on. The radiator was original and from sitting it was leaking. So I had the radiator record, new tires put on. What else did I do to the car? Uh, some of the rear suspension bushings from sitting were squeaky, so I fixed those and then tuned up the 455 in here and now it's ready to go. This car is just amazingly clean and straight. I think it maybe has one door ding on the whole car. But the paint shines, I did buff it and it looks wonderful. For a 70s paint job, it really doesn't have much orange peel to it, surprisingly. And one of the reasons why I was interested in this car is it has a lot of unique options. So you can see here it's got the power seat, divided front seat, some two pieces, power windows, tinted glass, power trunk lid release cornering lights, the sport styled mirrors, which I think look nice. The wire wheel discs, 455. The firm ride and handling package, tilt wheel. So I love the fact that it had this, you can see shock absorbers, firm ride front and rear, about halfway down a $5 option something that few ordered. So big block car, these came standard with a 350 with the firm ride and handling package. And when I asked the owner why she ordered it like this and without air conditioning, she said, well, in Northern Wisconsin, it really only gets hot a couple days out of the year. And air conditioning was a $400 ish option, very expensive. And she just didn't think that she needed it. And instead she checked the option box. She said on a lot of other things, including that firm ride and handling package, the cornering lights, the wheel disc, the power windows. So it was her way of paying for the other options. 
But you can tell this car, even though it's sat for many years, was just lovingly, lovingly sitting. The paint really doesn't have any dings or mars. The interior is beautiful in like new condition. I did have to clean up the interior a little bit. Had a little bit of mildew, but that's all gone now. It is funny, by this time, GM was starting to not build cars with the same level of quality they once did, like the 67 Oldsmobile. And, you know, you can see the trunk gaps here. This isn't great. This gap is horrendous by the passenger door here. I mean, I can get my pinky finger in there up to the first knuckle. And the gap is also big on the front side. So it's not that the door has shifted too far forward, it's just that the sheet metal didn't spread as it was supposed to. But nonetheless, in spite of its charm points, let's call them, still a great vehicle in a number of ways. Now by 1975, quite a few things had happened since the 60s and even the early 70s. One was you can see these big railroad tie bumpers in the front and back. That's because a five mile an hour impact standard was implemented where this car had to crash head on into a solid barrier at five miles an hour and sustain no damage. So that necessitated these big bumpers with the rub strip and even a tilt away grill that gets out of the way in the event the bumper has to collapse. So that affected the styling. Some people don't like these big bumper cars. Although this one, I think because it's all black and no vinyl roof, I think it's quite handsome. And the bumper set off the otherwise funeral parlor-esque car, I guess, if you will. Also by 1975, because of the bumpers and having to sustain that impact, these cars started to get heavier. So this car weighs 4,600 pounds. It's on a 124-inch wheelbase, about 226 inches in length. So it's longer than a modern Suburban, even though it's a two-door car. And by this year, the mighty 455, as it once was, was down to 190 horsepower. Although it was in the high 300s for torque, I think 370 foot-pounds of torque. So it still has quite a bit of low-end grunt. But the standard 350 cubic inch V8 was 170 horsepower. And you only got 20 more by going up to the 455. So... Perhaps in recognition of that, Oldsmobile took off, this used to say Rocket 455 in the earlier 70s. You can just see now it says 455. Perhaps they didn't think it was a rocket anymore. Although for me, this car drives extremely well if you're driving it normally. It gets off the line super quick. It's just that the upper RPM range is where it feels like it needs a little bit of extra breath, if you will. I did put this little plastic fuel filter on here and I've been monitoring the condition of the fuel coming from the tank since I put fresh gas in it. And the first fuel filter I put on in the first five gallons, there was a decent amount of sediment, but I've driven this car now for hmm, 25 miles or so and I'm not seeing any sediment, so I might get lucky and not have to replace the tank. But I did replace the radiator record it, changed all the coolant and fluids, changed the oil. I am going to have to replace the heater core. It has a slight leak in it, so I've just crudely bypassed this until I decide I'm going to tackle that job here in the short future. Just didn't want to do it in the next couple days. Wanted to enjoy the car. Did put a new master cylinder on. The old one was leaking and I changed the flex lines in the front, bled all the brakes, wheel cylinders in the back. So needed some brake work but all that stuff is typical on these old vehicles that you're getting running again for the first time. Just par for the course. So it's down to 190 horsepower. It's not the rocket that it once was, but again, this car gets off the line very smartly. 
and the motor doesn't need to rev it doesn't need to downshift if you're going to pass somebody it's got a great amount of torque and it goes about its business absolutely silently car still has a stock exhaust single exhaust with a muffler and a resonator from the factory and quieter than a church mouse so about the suspension system Oldsmobile as I've mentioned in the video on my 67 Olds actually set their cars up to handle quite well even though their clientele was an older and more conservative clientele in the 60s Oldsmobiles had stiffer spring rates bigger stabilizer bars I mentioned in the previous video that the 67 Olds that you can watch the video on front stabilizer bar is an inch versus the Pontiac of the same year is three quarters of an inch and the spring rates are 15 percent stiffer well by this time the stabilizer bars on most of the GM divisions for these full-size cars are the same 0.94 inches in diameter but each division really looked and changed the coil springs to suit the ride that they wanted so Oles as opposed to other divisions had computer selected springs custom matched to the car and the options so as an example if you added air conditioning to this car that would have added almost 120 pounds to the front axles and I think it actually maybe added only about five to the rear end just given where the weight was but that then affects the ride so Oles put a lot of engineering into their what they call g-ride system and the cars depending upon the option content the ride and handling package got a custom set of springs so that was something that was very different from any of the other GM divisions at the time and consequently this car while it's a big car handles really well for its size there's no body lean when you're cornering the ride is firm but not unpleasantly so certainly not firm by modern day standards but firm by standards of the time and the car is just a pleasure to drive so turning to the inside you have the wonderful key buzzer which I'll take out and one thing you'll notice is by this year the dash although it's better in my opinion than the 71 to 3 cars which have that very driver centric cockpit on almost all the GM divisions those interiors felt very cheap to me this is a bit nicer and some cost was put back in with really nice cloth on the door panel up here you have soft touch material up here but you still have this hard plastic area a strange location for the door switches or the window switches it's hard to reach when you're sitting you still have some quality issues like you can see this cloth wasn't trimmed correctly that's just a, I'll call it a hanging chad of cloth which I'm not going to cut off because it just some symbolizes the time that's definitely a factory defect and the faux wood grain isn't as convincing in my opinion as the 67's faux wood grain but this is still a nice place to be even though you don't have either the chrome trim anymore that the 67 has that said these 71 to 76 GM cars have this kind of semi wraparound glass pretty tall roof line particularly on the sedans this one's a bit lower being a coupe but you have a very open airy feeling that you can't get in a modern car especially with no chunky center console here and as I mentioned this is a non AC car so you have this little pull down here to activate the center vent and then there's pulls in each of the kick wells for the vents there which interestingly aren't on that little kick panel the vent is up tucked under the dash so it doesn't blow directly at you when you have it open car does have a rare combination AM radio with a power antenna and the power antenna you can switch it between local and distant so I'll just turn the key on here and you can see what happens so the antenna is activated by turning the radio on so I've got it on local right now I'll turn it on so that's how far it goes up for local and stops now if I flip the switch to distance the antenna extends the rest of the way and if I flip it back to local it doesn't retract back to that first setting I have to turn the radio off and then the antenna will 
retract, and you start the process over again. Car just has the idiot lights, no temperature gauges or anything like that. So very typical for the time unless you had a Chrysler. Chrysler was pretty good about putting gauges in the cars. GM and Ford were not. They had these idiot lights. But this cloth, this velour is like Velcro and it's extremely comfortable. These seats are well padded, firmer padding than the Buicks and the Pontiacs that I've driven of the era, even on the low mileage cars. Very pleasant car to drive on long distances. Let's take a look at the trunk, which the trunk release is in here. Oh, that key buzzer. And gotta love Oldsmobile and the huge accelerator pedal, which by the way was smaller in this year than the 67, but still very, I don't know, pronounced. Even the brake pedal is huge. Although the, the brake pedal was common across the GM divisions, for whatever reason, the gas pedal differs. So the Pontiacs have a different gas pedal than the Buicks and then the Chevrolets. I have no idea why they thought that they had to have different accelerator pedals across the GM divisions. Big trunk, 20 cubic feet. Not particularly well trimmed, it just has this mat that's glued down. And you can see that still is the original spare. Never been on the ground. Lip seal is in excellent shape. And I think these wire wheels, they're starting to grow on me. I like them a bit better now than when I first got it. Watch my video, by the way, for how to put these on without damaging them. These have clips that are very, very tough to get on they hold and grab tight on the rim. And if you use a rubber mallet, go to some of the car shows and you'll notice that these are all dented because people have the hardest time getting them back on. Well, I show in another video on my channel the technique that you can get these on really easily, which I employed here and you don't damage them. It's basically using your feet. This car, the doors actually close extremely nicely for a GM car of this generation, so I'll just push it with one finger. Although it does have that characteristic GM trim and door glass rattle when you close it. And since this car is so low mileage, both of these plastic clips are still on. These often broke off when the belt got hung up in the door or they got brittle over time. Great way to tell a low mileage original car. So all in all, extremely happy with this car wasn't something i was looking for i really love the 72 oldsmobile but this caught my eye and for the miles and condition and the options i thought it was super unique and you know the best way to not pay big dollars for a super low mileage car like this is to figure out and learn how to do some of the work yourself because then you buy a car i probably spent I don't know, 10 hours going through different things on it. But it wasn't a lot of expense aside from the tires and the radiator recore. It was just my time. So carburetor kits and fluids, brake components. No, oh, that's overly expensive. It just takes time to do. And I also am somebody who, with a car like this, I am not taking it to the tire store. I jack the car up and I take the tires in loose. I don't want somebody with their greasy clothes staining anything on something that's this nice. So I spend the extra time and do that. But even the bumper fillers, these are plastic fillers, are in really nice shape. If you want to drive a GM fan nuts who's got a low mileage car like this, push really hard or squeeze their bumper fillers and they'll just about have a heart attack because often they crack. So that's the overview. Let's take it for a ride.
All right, so here we are in the Olds. The motor's cold, so the fast idle will be on here for a little bit. But it starts right up now. And let's go. When I first got this car, it would buck and shake and shimmy. It just had really old, stale gas in it. And now that I've drained the tank, put fresh gas, flush the fuel system, wow, is it smooth. I actually, I'm kind of used to two-footing it because the car wanted to stall. And the motor is so smooth, I come to a stop sign and I think it's stalled out and no, it's just running. One unfortunate thing though about this generation of GM car is they tend to suffer from what I call the GM jiggle of this generation. And the 67 or the 65 to 70 GM full-size cars are just feel like they're higher quality. The interior materials are better. The door closures are so much better and more robust. Interesting somebody going the wrong way. And yet even though this car is imperfect, I really enjoy it. Drives great, whisper silent. You can hear a little bit of dash flutter, which is hyper common on the GM cars of this era. Some of the Fords too, when they redid the dash design in 73 on the full size, became less robust, even though it was common across Ford Merc and Mercury at that point. And later Lincoln got it in the later 70s too. But, you know, it's just the way it is. Character. With the firm ride and handling, this car, you can probably notice from the, the phone, it's not a soft ride, but it is not a intrusively harsh ride either. It's a really nice balance. And for $5, I probably would have paid that and opted for this as opposed to the standard ride and handling. With respect to the engine compared to a modern day vehicle, this car, yeah, I would say it gets off the line very fast. You have no lack of torque. You know, you step on it, but when you really put your foot into it at the higher RPM range, it almost feels a bit like a two barrel just because the heads and everything are pretty restrictive by this era. So it's got great takeaway or takeoff power. Not as great for passing power, but it's still a fun drive. So these cars, as I said, the 71 to 6 generation for GM is a bit imperfect. I will say this Olds feels more tightly screwed together than other ones that I have driven. And I'm not sure if that's uniquenesses associated with the ride and handling package or each division, as I was mentioning, had different suspension setups and each even engineered a bit of some of the under hood components and bracing differently. And I'll show you when I stop again what I mean. Just comparing this car versus the 67 Olds and how the engineers, I think, were trying to get rid of that jiggly feeling after they had designed a frame that was arguably too flexible for this big of a body. But here I'm coming to the stop sign and you know, look at my fingers. There's not even any trembling just resting on the wheel. It's perfectly smooth. And you know, the trim in here is, as I was mentioning, is decent, not perfect. I well, hope you enjoyed that little video of this Olds. By the way, this is a car that I'm writing a magazine article on. For those of you who wanted to see or missed some of the old car magazines, this will be the first article and I've completed, completed it. It's 14 pages. I'll create a separate video about it. I just need to figure out how to publish it and finalize it. So. Perhaps you can get your video fix and also read something that you might enjoy. Thanks for watching.
By the way, one little interesting tidbit for those of you who love GM cars of this era, you put the HVAC control, no matter if this has AC or not in the off setting, it's lying to you. That's not off. It's basically low fan speed. Fan runs all the time in these cars as part of the flow through ventilation system. It doesn't turn off. So now if your fan is off when this is in the off position and when you turn it to heater or some other setting and the fan is on low and you don't have any fan, then that's your low blower relay. That's pretty typical to go out. You may have the higher speeds, but there is a separate relay for some of the fan speeds, like the low speed on these HVAC systems. So something else to bear in mind if you're having some HVAC troubles. Thanks again for watching. Take care.